lucky that the public discussion of mental disorders has radically changed in the last five, ten years. And the next speaker, Professor Ian Hickey, has made incredible contributions to that. He's brave and he's cogent and he takes risks. But the ultimate benefit is there for us all to see. First of all, with the work with um, Beyond Blue, with a little b, which was really quite uh, radical for its time and is still playing a radical and important role in mental health in Australia. And now for his role as Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Sydney and the Director of the Brain and Mind Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Ian. Thanks, Gavin. I must thank uh, Julio for the invitation. It's great to see a psychiatrist as the director of this kind of centre in Australia. It says a lot about mental health. I think that some very important institution like this should see it as so important. And I really welcome Julio's emphasis on translational research. It's great to see Sam Gershon here, a very old friend that we shared in common, Neil McConaughey, who's unfortunately no longer with us. Sam knows well. And along with Gavin Andrews, very important people earlier in my career, uh, Gavin is clearly one of those people who in his career has gone places other people fear to go. And often in my career, I've, it's a bit like journey to the centre of the earth, I get to somewhere and I think I'm the first person to have been there, I didn't find Gavin Andrews' initials scrawled somewhere on the wall in a paper like 1982 or something. <laughs> been there before, but the trail got lost. This is actually my attempt to go somewhere where Gavin hasn't been before, I think, <laughs> but I'm not sure. In a sense, in a very broad collaboration in the University of Sydney, much as Julio was talking about, the need to have really translational research institutes that really do combine actually the work of basic scientists and clinical scientists, and much of it I'm sure we'll hear about Sam Gershon's career later in the day, is that real attempt for psychiatrists to be very actively engaged at the clinical interface, we've just been hearing so marvellously from Pat, and then trying to find ways in which our the lives of people that we deal with may be significantly improved. I was impressed by something Gavin did a few years ago about even if we rolled out the best of the treatments that we currently had, how much the burden of mental health problems would go away. And most of my career is devoted to trying to roll out the best that we have in this current state, through better community awareness, through better health services with Pat, through trying to get politicians to listen and invest in the areas in which we're in. But some days when I go to work, I'm supposed to turn up in this place, my office is over here in the corner somewhere, but every part of this institution, this is only two of the three buildings that now exist and have only been coming to being in the last five years, contain clinical facilities in neurology and psychiatry and general medicine combined with basic science. And really through the brainchild of Professor Max Bennett and the previous Vice-Chancellor of the University of Sydney, Gavin Brown, they agreed to have a place where mental health and neuroscience and critical neurology would be a large, not a small facility. And everyone would have to come in through the same front door so that patients and researchers and families would have to enter and leave each day to the same facility. So everyone knew what it was about, what was the focus. And the goal was to change the lives of those patients and families today, or as soon as we could to today, not in some far off place in the future. And every floor of the place has a mix. There isn't a floor or a place that the public is locked out of in the classical kind of research institute kind of way. So there are animal facilities, there are basic labs, but on every single floor and every single building, there is a mix of, in fact, clinical facilities, the clinical facilities on, on levels four and five of the building where I work in neurology and psychiatry with basic labs above and below, imaging facilities below, to try and have a way of thinking. Now, in doing that, we've tried to try to think something we have in common, <laughs> you know, try and think of a neurological paradigm or a neuroscientist paradigm to underpin this philosophy. And what I'm going to talk about, in a sense, to some degree, is a way of looking at glial neuronal networks in such a way that allows us to focus on that integration and also to focus on the nervous system as a responsive system, not as a fixed system, not as a piece of hardware that is fixed, but reacts to the world in the way that we know it does and reacts to treatments in the way that we know it does, but starts to try and explain that and perhaps to maximise the potential to further manipulate that through advances in neuroscience. At times I think I don't spend enough time inside the place trying to take that work forward, but it's a very productive place in which to work. And the challenge is very large. For those of you who picked up science just last month, and despite what you read in the daily papers, it's a news story about how much money the pharmaceutical industry is pulling out of neuroscience's research due to failures in the area and what they see as a very dim future. It's just all too hard. And in fact, Tom Insel, 
uh, writing in that article, the director of NOMH made the fairly bl straightforward and blunt statement, there are very few new molecular entities, very few novel ideas, and almost nothing that gives hope for a transformation in the treatment of mental illness. Now, if you went out and said that at the moment to politicians, I don't think that would help us to get new investment in the area. But he's saying it is very complex, and one of the problems has been that we've been stuck in some particular paradigms. Some very simplistic ideas about illness categories and very simplistic ideas about their interventions. As you can see from Pat's work, we spent a lot of time trying to take paradigms from general medicine, particularly in cardiovascular disease and cancer, where people very rarely talk about one thing that will be done that will prevent the illness, treat the illness at all stages and deliver good outcomes in very narrow types of ways. Most of the interventions are multimodal across many areas. A lot of the things that reduce risk are not the same as those provided in the early stages of treatment nor those provided later in treatment. Many of the risk factors, like smoking, for example, are shared across a range of different areas and shared across cancer and cardiovascular disease. There isn't the narrow kind of DSM-ness that we fall into and a search for kind of one cause, one answer on an ongoing basis. The costs in this area is actually to do anything to it are very large, and in fact the costs in mental health are considerably larger for a new medicine, take longer and have lower chances of success than any of the other major illness categories. So what we think we are in search of are very new novel ideas. I was arguing with one of my own researchers just this week who was complaining about yet another one of our papers being rejected from a journal because it didn't follow the usual DSM categorisation thing. I said, look, be like Gavin Andrews, just dare to be different, <laughs> okay? There's some chance that out of that novelty and that interplay of ideas, you might wander across something that is really worth doing, much in the way that one might imagine that uh, John Kay did in Melbourne back in the 1940s and wander across lithium and see now still 60, 70 years later. I'm not totally sure what it does, but it does a lot of good things out of a series of accidental ideas. And I think in many ways, these larger translational institutions uh, where good clinical ideas are taken back into laboratory settings and we work with other scientists may offer us considerable hope. I do think Insel's right. If we continue to go down the current ways we've been doing things, we aren't likely to make great progress. And it's a time when the world really wishes that we would make progress. What has happened out in the wider world, as an excellent summary by the UK Government Office of Science published in Nature back in 2008, is lots of people are really interested in what we're doing, not just for the mental health of nations, but for the mental wealth of nations. That in our developed societies and in the developing world, so much of what we need are citizens with very strong cognitive and behavioural resources to contribute to the communities and the economies on which we depend. And it's very interesting in their whole summary of the evidence base that this little five-word sentence stands out, that in each of the particular areas they were talking about, early interventions would be the key. We don't know enough about prevention, pure prevention in a lot of areas at this moment to make an enormous difference. We do know a lot in that preemptive early intervention type area at different stages of illness. There's a very important diagram in that article, and one of which I'm sure Beverly would appreciate since you had a very similar diagram for our national promotion and prevention I forget the exact name of the task force, but out of the first national mental health plan, about needing to see it across the life cycle. I was taken outside and beaten up by a child psychiatrist recently when I was talking about early intervention, because he said early intervention only belonged to child psychiatry to the first two years of life. I said, actually, early intervention belongs to the whole of medicine. <laughs> it's a really important idea that there are critical phases in many illnesses right across the life cycle, where if you get in early, you're likely to reduce the harm, as Pat has emphasised from a social point of view. But in terms of the neurobiology, it might be quite different and the strategies might be quite different. So that we see a lot of emphasis in area we won't discuss today, but in early intervention in dementia and within our institute looking for early signs to intervene to, prolong, to postpone progression, obviously, so that you don't dement before death. We tend to emphasise a lot of the issues about early childhood, but that right across the life cycle, there are early opportunities. Now, what is lacking from a lot of this is, in fact, a sort of neural paradigm for what is the plasticity of the nervous system. So many of you will see Norman Deutsch's book about the brain changing itself and the idea of plasticity. But what that actually means and the cellular elements and the biology of that remains quite contentious. But it is clear there are lots of opportunities and the brain does change in its reactivity and the risk to illness or resilience or prevention of illness is a very fluid concept and one in which we need to develop a much greater depth of understanding. I think the issues about driving new paradigms, we are in desperate need of paradigm shifts. One that really bedevils us in the health system is just simply understanding the epidemiology. Great to see Scott Henderson here in the Social Psychiatry Research Unit here for many years saying how important epidemiology is right across the life cycle. But the reality for major mental disorders was 75% starting before the age of 25 and the peak 
area of onset, is we need to have this understanding. What is happening neurobiologically? What is happening socially throughout the whole adolescent period? I'll come to the issue of commonality. As Pat alluded to with his railroad analogy, you might get interested in just one rain line. Your life might be directed to the Great South East Line which arrives in part of the bay outside Melbourne, or the Great Western Line which finally gets to Penrith in Sydney, or not. <laughs> you know, if actually you could actually tear up all the line at Redfern for those who are based in Sydney and prevent all those disorders, that would be much more attractive than just preventing one train line or changing the course of all the people who are travelling. So rather than searching constantly for the unique characteristic of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, of depression or anxiety disorders or PTSD or the 101 other anxiety disorders, and I'm sure, Gavin, more anxiety disorders have been invented as we sit here, you know, rather than searching for the unique characteristic of each, you're searching for the common processes which may underpin those disorders and have the greatest opportunity of reducing the morbidity associated with all. Not that they'll necessarily prevent all, but they may have certain contributions to be made, as does reducing hypertension or reducing cholesterol medicine for many other disease processes, not just for heart disease or stroke or renal disease itself, but because of reducing the morbidity across a range of disease outcomes if those processes are not down with. The adolescent period itself is a very complex one of multiple genetic and social transitions. The very simple ideas about transitions, either genetically or socially, are no longer valid. And there's an excellent paper by, I've got the complete reference here, by Ken Kendler looking at Scandinavian twins, just about the number of genetic transformations that are likely between the ages of 12 and 25 contributing to depression. And that data would argue there are at least four major genetically determined developmental periods just between 12 and 25 that affect the likelihood of being depressed as an adult. Uh, Pat's dealt a lot on we don't really care for diagnostic categories much, or particularly not the DSM ones. We don't find them very useful. DSM, fortunately, or despite much criticism, is recognising, of course, in the underlying vulnerabilities, they're much more likely to be dimensional. Not easy to apply in clinical practice, but very important to understand if you can understand the biology or the social risk factors that lie behind. I'll come to Tom uh, Intel's comment about the circuits in some detail, but moving to something that maps the brain in a more realistic way rather than trying to find individual kind of circuits for individual disorders is an important issue. Pat's uh, talked a lot about staging. We do think there's a need for a different clinical paradigm. The whole goal here is we have fallen behind the goal in the rest of medicine. The rest of the medicine already got to staging a long time ago and is now trying to get to personalised medicine, which is trying to work out within a stage what is best for you not just for all people with early breast cancer, but within early breast cancer, depending on your oncogenes and your type and whatever, what choice is actually best for you within that general category. We suggest we're about two steps behind a really important paradigm in the rest of medicine, which is to take the staging idea and then look for within stage characteristics that might tell us who to provide more intensive treatments to earlier on. Another issue we think has held psychiatry back is a kind of preoccupation with genetic developmentalism. And Pat and I have written about this in relation to psychotic disorders, that not enough emphasis has been put on the extent to which genetic vulnerabilities are altered by environmental exposures at critical phases of development. And a critical interplay between the environment and genetic risk needs to be constantly appreciated and brought into our work, both in terms of reducing risk, but also in terms of changing outcomes. Really picking up Beverly's later point, that many people do recover and if they recover, that reflects a very active process. There must be underlying active brain processes to contribute to that recovery on an ongoing basis. And a simple kind of genetic developmentalism broke out in psychiatry in the 1980s, we think may have been particularly unhelpful. We do have a lot of technologies now that were useful, particularly if we get beyond there's one test at one time which will correlate with one diagnosis. We see it much more in terms of like paediatric growth charts, mapping particular factors over time and seeing where people get off their trajectories and then having a greater basis for intervention. I'll come to some uh, examples of that. And perhaps most importantly for the therapeutic areas, looking for novel intervention strategies. We're really looking for the ones that might have broad effect. It isn't what the FDA wants. It isn't what the TGA wants here in Australia. It isn't what they want a simple drug for, or a simple psychological therapy, for one disorder. There are many critics, including those in this country, who say, well, this is all no good because these drugs treat several disorders, or these psychological therapies are good for several conditions. We actually think that's a good thing, not a bad thing. I was at an event the weekend where a pharmaceutical company was trying to promote the value of now having a multifunction molecule, having spent the previous 30 years trying to promote the idea of having a single function kind of molecule as the ideal paradigm. It is one, I think, that people have come to appreciate. We're probably going to have to hit many targets to actually get good effects. And this is where I'll come to the glioneuronal thing is particularly interesting. Pat's mentioned the neuroprotective issues. And I think it leads to an emphasis also on systems 
that have not been the traditional targets. So they're not the simple monoamine targets that we've been focused on, and two of the ones that I'll talk about, or three, are the neuroimmune circadian access and others related to social cognition. We need to think about what actually are the targets, not simple DSM categories, but what things we're trying to change and what are the opportunities for changing those aspects of illness rather than necessarily whole syndromes. This is a, a, a slice of the, pat, of the slide that Pat showed earlier. Clearly, in terms of the onset of all the major mental disorders, adolescence really matters. But what always strikes me about this slide is not the preoccupation about this is substance abuse or that's schizophrenia or that's anxiety disorders or that's depressive disorders. It's what must be going on in common. Why is adolescence such a period of risk for all disorders? And it suggests to me the commonality rather than, in fact, the differentiation of disorders, and that from a biological and from a social process, we should be looking for those commonalities that may be open to change during that particular period. Now, of course, in terms of commonalities, we know a great deal. We know a great deal at the synaptic level that much of childhood is associated with forming as many synapses as you can, as quickly as you can, in relation to every single experience that you have. And that's what brain development is about as a child. But from late childhood and early adolescence onwards, it's about efficiency. It's about pruning synapses throughout that whole period. And that is a very active biological process. And we know that some of the disorders that we look at, for example, schizophrenia, some of the psychotic disorders, may be associated with accelerated synaptic pruning during that period. That may come off the same base, or it may come off a lower base due to neuro prior neurodevelopmental problems. But we know there's a very different active process going on in terms of synaptic pruning. We obviously know from the marvelous NIH studies about the differences we can now see in brain development as that synaptic pruning process goes on, and the process of frontal lobe development in particular, so relevant to psychiatric disorders, is largely a post-pubertal phenomena and one that extends into the early 20s. It doesn't respect our age of choice, the marvelous 18 thing. It doesn't necessarily say that childhood and adolescence is just the same, or that we, in either our biology or in our clinical practice, as now the marvellous new plan of Victoria says that 0 to 25 is all the same. You know, by not wanting to sort of sort it out again or have too many professional fights, we'll put it together in various ways. Obviously, Pat and others have been associated with trying to differentiate the 12 to 25 period. But biologically, we've got to have a strong sense of what's underpinning that critical phase of brain change. And as that frontal lobe development goes on, what's going on in association with it? And so the really important factors are actually changing in fundamental systems during that period, particularly in the hypothalamic pituitary axis, but also in things like the circadian system and related immune systems during that period of frontal lobe development. There are other factors going on, including environmental factors. One of the big ones going on in our society, one we're really interested in, is fundamental changes in sleep-wake cycles. At this period where you really should be sleeping a long time and sleeping in and letting growth hormone go, lots of our kids are going to bed later and sleeping less as a big change in social sort of functioning, likely to have significant are effects on their developing circadian systems. And as many of us are aware, there are patterns of substance use, particularly binge drinking in terms of alcohol, but also stimulant and cannabis use in young people, which are likely to have toxic effects on frontal lobe development. As big environmental factors that we need to track alongside track and their, and their consequences alongside tracking these sets of issues. Now, in terms of doing this, what's that's led to in our own institution is a big emphasis on trying to understand environmental risk as we continue to track what is going on biologically. I'll just skip over me there. The more attractive people here, as I had neuropsychologists who work with neurologists, and this is Professor Max Bennett, Professor of Physiology, some of you may know, who works down at the synaptic level with inflammatory molecules, who now devotes his career, as I'll show you, largely to seeing its relevance to psychiatric disorder. We've been very lucky to have people join us from overseas, like Richard Bernardi, who works very much in the neuroimaging area, Bernard Blaine and Jürgen Goetz, who bring other sorts of specialised neurosciences expertise into this game. And the paradigm is well summarised by Caspian Moffat in a journal in Nature of Views and Neurosciences back in 2006, where we spent a long time looking for the genes to match so-called DSM disorders, largely led us nowhere, and still spent a long time trying to get genes to match phenotypes, which really don't go very far either. A much more interesting way to go is to go, well, we know a lot about environmental risks, so why don't we go out and collect people who are exposed to similar risk and try and understand the way in which their genetic uh, predispositions are actually allowing or permitting the nervous system to change in particular ways that might give rise to disorder. Now, it's not only a different way of doing the neuroscience. You can see also, if you really are interested in prevention, you've got much better chances of changing environments than you have of changing fundamental genotypes. And you actually 
we underutilise these particular sets of issues, even though we've had great things like the uh, NHMRC Social Psychiatry Unit here for decades, trying to emphasise the importance of understanding the social environments in which we live. And increasingly, we need to find ways of integrating that neuroscience into that dialogue, trying to understand the complex interactions between genes and environments and how they are played out in the nervous system. Now, to say how they're implied over the nervous system and sort of get back to what I'm sort of supposed to be talking about, which is glioneuronal kind of interactions, you'd have to have a nervous system which wasn't simply one nervous cell talking to another, one neuron talking to another neuron in the classical sense. And a lot of the work of my colleague Max Bennett is tied up in looking at the way astrocytes and microglial cells, particularly microglial cells, immune cells in the nervous system, are highly reactive to the environment obviously to inflammatory and infective stimuli, but as I show you, also clearly now activated in psychiatric disorders and reactive to probably other issues like cognitive stimuli as well. And that the fundamental biochemistry of the synapse is best thought of now as at least a four cellular element in which there are very complex interplay of chemicals that we would not normally talk about in the psychiatric setting, particularly the role of pro-inflammatory cytokines in various ways, their effect on neurotransmitter systems, and the potential transformation of neural circuits by cells which are highly reactive to the environments. So this is not a fixed railroad. I'm always worried when Pat gets out that fixed railroad thing, because I want to say to him, actually, we don't know people are on a ticket to anywhere, <laughs> necessarily. And there is the possibility that someone comes along and takes you off the train that you're on. <laughs> and takes you somewhere else. I don't know about you, I quite hope that someone will talk to me on the old train I get on, and maybe we'll go somewhere other than where I'm planning to go along the way. Think of microglial cells as be those rare people who sometimes chat to you, and you decide that you might do something different today, and you may not end up where you're planning to go, for better or worse. Another really important set of um, understandings here, I think, is that, uh, additionally uh, taken out by Tom Insulin, so made very plain, that our current classification systems have not led us very far in psychiatric research. And since the new project now being run by NIH really goes back to research domains. And what, what we near really need are new ways of describing the problems that we see. Fear circuitry, reward circuitry, executive function, the more reliable behavioural phenotypes, not necessarily specific to the disorders that we currently describe clinically, and commonly seen to different degrees in the number of disorders that we see. And it really to allow us as researchers to actually be much more mechanistic, to study the mechanisms as they cut across these categories and have a much better idea of uh, understanding the diaspora effects that can stem from fundamental differences at a circuit level. And that's the kind of very much the idea that we are interested in, uh, in looking at glioneuronal networks. Within the BMRI itself, as I go on to show you, we've tried to interpret that, with the odd spelling mistake, in a number of different ways. So you won't see there's a depression program, there isn't a psychosis program, there isn't a bipolar program, there isn't necessarily a developmental program. There are a series of issues where we're trying to look at the role of infecting inflammatory processes, the role of things like social cognition, which is impaired in anxiety disorders, in autism, in schizophrenia, the role of novel interventions, particularly oxytocin. Trying to look at other factors, particularly circadian factors, which you think are relevant to onset, but particularly relevant to some of the common complications in our area, beyond alcohol and drug use in terms of metabolic factors and some other models. Very much that's our in-house work. In the large clinical trials we do, it's very much in association with PAT, taking that developmental perspective uh, forward. And I really would want to emphasise the extent to which PAT's group's been important in their Lancet paper with Chris Pantelis, that actually brain, the brain was changing at critical aspects of transition to illness. That's a really important concept. There must be active biochemical and transitional processes to accompany those uh, changes on brain scanning at that point. So one of our goals got to become understanding what those critical processes are for the potential of modifying them. At the same time, we have large collaborative studies running in Australia, fortunately, as a consequence of Nick Martin and the Australian Twin Registry, really looking at longitudinal studies of adolescents with MRI and also with circadian patterns to understand what is happening in critical phases of development in normals, to better understand the development of these processes in non-ill populations. So the overall schema that we have, and this will be relevant to a number of things to show, is to try and say, look, we're all working at a number of different levels, but let's not start up here and assume that these things are actually right. Let's try and deal with the complexes that we much better understand in symptom sets, that are much more reliably actually recorded on on for which we've got much more reliable behavioural measures, and for which we have a number of other measures. Let's try and understand, much as, it, as suggested by the NIH, uh, idea of uh, uh, domains and trying to map circuits. What are the circuits that are going on? But they're not just circuits of neurons. 
they are circuits of the much wider sets of glial and neuronal networks. And the glial element becomes particularly important when you get down to the cellular level that are at the synaptic level, there ain't just neurons. There's a bunch of cells out there highly likely to be influencing synapses and circuit development that are highly responsive to the environment, to things which might cause illness on an ongoing basis, but also at a therapeutic level that may actually respond in a variety of different ways, particularly at critical stages of illness. So we're looking for measures, and not shown on this slide, I'll show you later on, interventions that might be relevant and may be able to be mapped to various levels of complexity. One of the great joys of working where I work is when I don't really know what I'm talking about, like at about 9 o'clock this morning, I ran into Max Bennett's office and go, now look, Max, I'm not sure I've really got this right about what we think is going on in terms of grey matter reduction in a lot of the scanning studies that we see and which cellular elements are really being knocked off as we talk about these transitions of illness. He said, funny thing, Ian, I've just spent the last year trying to work out myself exactly which elements would be knocked off to explain things like an 8% change in cortical volume you might see in association with first onset schizophrenia and what could it be. And Max's belief system is really, in terms of the sort of changes we're now tracking on MRI scanning, it's not going to be loss of cells. We already know it's not degeneration of neurons. We've known that for over 100 years. While we're interested in all the glial cells and, in fact, in synaptic stripping in many of these disorders, that itself isn't going to explain the volume of change we're seeing. It can really probably only be changes in dendrites on an ongoing basis, coming and going, that is actually likely to explain the MRI changes we see in association with many of the disorders. The important thing about to say about the formation of dendrites and the loss of dendrites, it is the highly plastic process. It's driven by what is happening at a synaptic level as you form synapses in relation to experiences or you strip synapses, which can be in relation to toxins or can be in relation to no experience. If you want to lose synapses, go lie in a dark room, do nothing. Go get unemployed as a young person. Go lose out of education. You'll lose synapses on a particular basis, which itself will lead to loss of dendrites on an ongoing basis. So the formation of synapses and the loss of synapses under particular processes drive what is really happening to the size of the dendritic tree. So, for example, as many young people do, great to be here on Monday morning, but many young people are not at work on Monday morning because they've been out taking their favourite substances throughout the weekend. What they'll have actually done, for example, in association with binge drinking, is stripped their dendritic tree. There's a kind of rose pruning analogy, if you like. Dendrites will go very quickly in the face of toxins like alcohol. Of course, no one over the age of about 30 drinks like this anymore. But, you know, if you were, or you do yourself overindulge, this may have been what happened. Now, you have the chance to recover, you know, just in that seasonal kind of sense, in relation to new experiences and in relation to recovery, you'll grow those trees again. Of course, if you persist with the behaviour, that loss of dendrites results into this, and this is actually binge drinkers in young people. Just forget the overlap with alcohol and cannabis. This is highly controversial. Just go with this one for a moment, which is easy to explain. Even in young adults, you will see significant changes in frontal lobe structures and volumes in relation to heavy patterns of binge drinking at a very early age. You don't have to drink for decades to start to see very significant changes in brain volumes. And those in the heavy alcohol users alone, you see the same thing with regards to hippocampal volume loss. So we're seeing in a lot of issues in the more serious situations like binge drinking behaviour, well, we think it's serious, as Pat's alluded to, we have colleagues in this country who think we shouldn't bother about drinking amongst young persons. It's not worthy of intervention. <laughs> Certainly if you go and look at the brain evidence about those groups and the cognitive performance and accident and injury associated, it's worthy of intervention. You also see white matter changes and other evidence of, of cells in, in whole bodies and, and the controversial area of whether, in fact, it is affecting neurogenesis in the same way. Now, we've been trying to apply this type of model then across the range of the disorders. That's three fingers. That's one for me, one for you, and <laughs> three minutes. Good. <laughs> we'll cover it all in three minutes. If you want to take any of the particular disorder type categories, what we're trying to do is then try and work out what are the key domains within a particular illness category, if you like, like first episode psychosis? What are the key circuits? But really also, what are the key triggers? And look for measures that we can actually use at various levels. But more important than measures, per se, is thinking about novelties of interventions. If cognitive training does work in psychosis to improve cognition, how does it work? What is the way in which it is working? If the fatty acid example that Pat is talking about does work to delay the onset of psychosis, where and through what mechanisms is it actually acting? Uh, if oxytocin does increase socialisation in the social disorders, in the disorders associated with impairment of social cognition like schizophrenia, how and where is it activating uh, relevant systems on an ongoing basis? 
for the sake of time, I'll, I'll just skip over that. If you look at the total of MRI volume changes, again, this is one of Max Bennett's slides, what you notice across the disorders I suggest is, in fact, the commonality, not the differences. While it's true that you see more changes, for example, in the insulin schizophrenia, it doesn't mean that those without bipolar disorder and depression are without such changes. Or if you focus on the anterior cingulate, as many people do in depression, it doesn't mean that people with schizophrenia are without those disorders. In other words, there are clearly different circuits that are associated to some degree with different phenomena. But a lot of the brain changes we are seeing in many disorders is probably shared in common. With regards to tracking particular glial elements, this is work that Richard Bernardi did in London with uh, looking at PET scan in patients with schizophrenia and correlating it with ERP measures of electrophysiological change and actually seeing microglial activation in association with the degree of ERP change in patients with schizophrenia. That we are now able to track the extent to which, for example, glial cells are active in these key phases of illness. And we start to look at the circuitry. Again, some of Mac's work looking at those particular issues. We've been very involved in the same sets of issues in depression, looking at actually what sets of factors are associated with brain change, but more importantly, trying to get onto intervention studies that might actually be relevant. And just for the sake of time, I'll skip along. So as I was saying, we're taking really Pat's model and work collaboratively on this about common starting points and shared biology, but also trying to say, OK, for those we get early who look about the same, they're clearly not all exactly the same. Are we going to be able to predict risk within those particular areas? So we're very much focused on also not only on actually the stage, but to what extent can we use the technologies that we currently have to actually look at within stage testing? And to what extent will they guide future treatment decisions? So the sort of chart or the sort of modality thing that we are interested in, in looking at these particular areas, is, tr is tracking young people with multiple modes of testing across early phases of illness. This is zero to six months. And I'll just focus on one example here, which I think will fit in with the rest of the afternoon. Looking at particularly the role of neuroimmune markers early in illness. What's clear from Chris's work in schizophrenia, and I think some of the depression work, is probably of periods of acute insult early in the course of illness, not just of acquired insult continuously across the phase of illness. There's a very good analogy of this in Parkinson's disease, where the immune markers are very high early in the illness, but are largely absent once nerve cells are dead later in the illness. If you can pick up that kind of phase early on, that might suggest different, quite different interventions, focusing on glial cell elements, anti-inflammatory type strategies early in the illness, which may be quite different if you're working later on with changes in different markers at a later phase. So right at the moment, what we've tried to do is create entities. This is the back of the buildings I showed you earlier on. This is our new youth mental health building, funded by Morris Yemmer, I might stage, for those who can remember his brief period as New South Wales Premier. But it's great to have someone who takes an interest. There are four floors in this particular building. The bottom floor is occupied by the Inspire Foundation with eHealth Technologies. It's also occupied by a zebrafish facility. The second floor is occupied by Headspace. Gavin's telling me to get off. The third, in fact, by basic laboratories in these areas. But I think this is the kind of facility that we need, where we've got people, technologies, an emphasis on both what is new, our favourite thing, which is what is old, and great to see Sam Gershon here, what is it doing to circadian systems, for example, and ways of looking at the biomarkers, but not in the, just the traditional way, really looking beyond the biomarkers that we've usually had to those of particularly glial and neuronal networks that might guide our measurement in terms of markers of illness progression and also might assist us in finding novel interventions where we're able to track progress in a different way. Thanks. I missed one word in the introduction. You're wise as well as brave and intelligent. <laughs> Questions? Yes. <laughs> 
I think that's been the dominant paradigm, though, for 20 or 30 years, since the real birth of modern genetics and in psychiatry, the sort of populations. It's led to the big GWAS studies we've had. It certainly still drives the NIH, I think, in trying to now get the circuits with the genes that may have specific... And we're not challenging, really, that, of course, there is great value potentially in that. We are challenging the extent to which it's delivered to this point. But we're also trying to say it will not be the full explanation. It's one way of looking at the sets of problems. Even if you've got the genetic vulnerability, it's highly likely there are other factors that influenced the onset and course of illness. So in terms of the genes setting up the vulnerability, that vulnerability must be played out within the nervous system, no doubt about that, in its particular ways, or in systems within the nervous system. It may not be the only ones that matter. And certainly gene-environment interactions. I'll just, um, Gavin won't notice this, but I'll just pop along to a different slide. If you go to the inflammatory pathways to depression, which we're really interested in, then Max and I spend a lot of time on different genes, like P2X7 and its regulation for immune activation, because it's an immune activator affecting those microglial cells, but actually it also turns out to be one of the gene risk factors to bipolar disorder and to depression. Right? So I think there are, yeah, of course, there are going to be genes. We're really interested in the genes, however, that are high influence also your responsivity to the environment. And they may be quite different ones to those who currently think about genes as really neurodevelopmental tracks, as simply creating sort of brain, the hardware, if you like, or the railway tracks. We're interested in the social experience on the railways that might actually get you to get off the train, even if you're on that track. If that doesn't take the analogy too far. <laughs> Right. I think that's the, the source of the argument, because I think in, for 30 years it's been said we all accept heterogeneity. So we'll get more and more pure groups, or the GWAS approach will just get bigger and bigger groups, and eventually the signal will fall out. So it's either by making them very small, narrow phenotypes, or by getting everybody. We're actually of the view that neither of those is actually helpful, because they so mix early and chronic phases of disease. Barry Halliwell has a marvellous example of neuroimmune markers in Parkinson's disease, where they could find the immune markers if they looked at patients early in the illness, but couldn't find them at all if they mixed them up with all the people later in the illness. So we think a lot of the failure has not just been diagnostic, but mixing constantly earlier phases with chronicity or complications of illness. So we've gone for our stage is more similar than diagnosis, in fact. At certain stages, and I haven't shown you the circadian data we've got here, because Gavin's chucking me off, that actually at certain phases, the circadian data in young people across disorders is much more common than, in fact, the diagnostic specificity. And it has its own clock genes and period genes and other things. And it's subject to its own interventions, classically lithium or other sets of issues. So I think one of the great debates in psychiatry is going to be the classically diagnostically driven and trying to find the signal despite the heterogeneity. We're actually going for the other. We have got a, we've introduced a set of constraints, which is our hypothesis, that the psychotic disorders and at least the severe mood disorders are close enough genetically and developmentally that they, within that, if we study the right stage, we'll get more homogeneity or, or, or large signals than we've got so far. Of course. So if you take the uh, analogy with hypertension or, you know, uh, 
I guess we like these sort of general medical analogies. But let's take the analogy with hypertension or hypercholesterolemia. I mean, you know, if you want to get the biggest bang for your buck, you probably do it early before you have your first big event because the event itself gives rise to a whole lot of secondary morbidity. You know, you want to have, not have your first heart attack. You certainly don't want to have your second and third, otherwise you end up with heart failure, a different phenotype altogether down the way. So you may get your biggest backbone there. You still may modify those same risk factors, however, in someone who's had their first heart attack to prevent subsequent attacks. But the actual value of the intervention may change. Now, I think that becomes the point, is that at certain phases of illness, it's critical to change some aspect of the phenotype, to get rid of suicidality and acute depression, or to get rid of cognitive disorganisation in acute schizophrenia. Maybe the from a disability point most important. It may also, and I think this is what the brain imaging imaging suggests, the greatest chance to preserve brain function, particularly in acute psychosis, might be in the two or three years of the most severe period of onset. If you look at the work that Chris Pantelis is doing and others are doing currently, the greatest period of grey matter change is in that early process. We expect, expect, suspect there is some sort of inflammatory process at work there. Right? Now, I don't mean to separate to infection, but inflammatory process. And moderation of that inflammatory process, like through fish oils or some of the process, at that point might be the most critical intervention for changing the course. You may or may not see its effect on the phenotype at that particular point in time. That's where we need better biomarkers of real progress. Well, I guess hence our preoccupation with glial cells. There's a cellular elements that are very responsive, which probably do harm when they're unleashed, but also have the potential to modify systems to benefit if we could actually make use of them. So in this, in this place, very important to see. We probably think immune cells do matter more. Thank you very much.